My Platonic Sweetheart by Mark Twain. Mark Twain was always interested in those psychic phenomena which we call dreams. His own sleep fancies were likely to be vivid, and it was his habit to recall them and to find interest and sometimes amusement in their detail. In the story which follows, he sat down, and not without some fidelity to circumstance, dreams circumstance, a phase of what we call recurrent dreams. As the tale progressed, he felt an inclination to treat the subject more fully, more philosophically, and eventually he laid the manuscript away. The time did not come when he was moved to rewrite it, and for the pure enjoyment of it, as a delicate fancy, it may be our good fortune that he left it unchanged, says Albert Bigelow Payne. I met her first when I was seventeen and she fifteen. It was in a dream. No, I did not meet her. I overtook her. It was in a Missourian village, which I had never been in before, and it was not in at that time except dream-wise. In the flesh, I was on the Atlantic seaboard, ten or twelve hundred miles away. The thing was sudden and without preparation. After the custom of dreams, there I was, crossing a wooden bridge that had a wooden rail and was untidy with scattered wisps of hay, and there she was, five steps in front of me. Half a second previously, neither of us was there. This was the exit of the village, which lay immediately behind us. Its last house was the blacksmith shop and the peaceful clinking of the hammers, a sound which nearly always seems remote, and is always touched with a spirit of loneliness and a feeling of soft regret for something you don't know what was wafted to my ears over my shoulder. In front of us, was the winding country road with woods on one side and on the other a rail fence with blackberry vines and hazel bushes crowding its angles. On an upper rail, a bluebird and scurrying towards him along the same rail, a fox squirrel with his tail bent high like a shepherd's crook. Beyond the fence, a rich field of grain and far away, a farmer in sh shirt sleeves and straw hat wading knee deep through it. No other representatives of life and no noise at all, everywhere a Sabbath stillness. I remember it all, and the girl too, and just how she walked, and how she was dressed. In the first moment, I was five steps behind her, and the next one I was at her side, without either stepping or gliding. It merely happened the transferred, ignored space. I noticed that, but not with any surprise. It seemed a natural process. I was at her side, I put my arm around her waist, and drew her close to me, for I loved her, and although I did not know her, my behavior seemed to me quite natural and right. I had no misgivings about it. She showed no surprise, no distress, no displeasure, but put an arm around my waist and turned up her face to mine with a happy welcome to it, and when I bent down to kiss her, she received the kiss as if she was expecting it, and as if it was quite natural for me to offer it, and her to take it and have pleasure in it. The affection which I felt for her and which she manifestly felt for me was a quite simple fact, but the quality of it was another matter. It was not the affection of brother and sister. It was closer than that, more clinging, more endearing, more reverent, and it was not the love of sweethearts, for there was no fire in it. It was somewhere between the two and was finer than either and more exquisite, more profoundly contenting. We often experience this strange and gracious thing in our dream loves, and we remember it as a feature of our childhood loves, too. We strolled along across the bridge and down the road, chatting like the oldest friends. She called me George, and that seemed natural and right, though it was not my name, and I called her Alice, and she did not correct me, even though without doubt it was not her name. Everything that happened seemed just natural, and be expected. Once I said, what a dear little hand it is, and without any words, she laid it gracefully in mine for me to examine it. I did it, remarking upon its littleness, its delicate beauty, and its satin skin. Then kissed it, she put it up to her lips without saying anything, and kissed it in the same place. 
around a curve of the road, and at the end of half a mile, we came to a log house and entered it and found the table set and everything on it, steaming hot, a roast turkey, corn in the ear, butter beans, and the rest of the usual things, and a cat curled up asleep in a splint bottom chair by the fireplace, but no people, just emptiness and silence. She said she would look in the next room if I would wait for her. So I sat down and she passed through a door, which closed behind her with a click of the latch. I waited and waited. Then I got up and followed, for I could not any longer bear to have her at my sight. I passed through the door and found myself in a strange sort of cemetery, a city of innumerable tombs and monuments, stretching far and wide on every hand, and flushed with pink and gold lights, flung from the sinking sun. I turned around, and the loghouse was gone. I ran here and there, and yonder down the lanes, between the rows of tombs, calling Alice, and presently the night closed down, and I could not find my way. Then I woke in deep distress over my loss, and was in my bed in Philadelphia, and I was not seventeen now, but nineteen. Ten years afterwards, in another dream, I found her. I was seventeen again, and she was still fifteen. I was in a grassy place, in the twilight deeps of a magnolia forest, some miles above Natchez, Mississippi. The trees were snowed over with great blossoms, and the air was loaded with their rich and strenuous fragrance. The ground was high, and through a rift in the wood, a burnished patch of the river was visible in the distance. I was sitting on the grass, absorbed in thinking, when an arm was laid around my neck, and there was Alice sitting by my side and looking into my face. A deep and satisfied happiness and an unwordable gratitude rose in me, but with it there was no feeling of surprise, and there was no sense of a time lapse. The ten years amounted to hardly even a yesterday. Indeed, to hardly even a noticeable fraction of it, we dropped in the tranquillest way into affectionate caressings and pettings, and chatted along without a reference to the separation, which was natural. For I think we did not know there had been any that one might measure with either clock or almanac. She called me Jack, and I called her Helen, and those seemed the right and proper names, and perhaps neither of us suspected that we had ever borne others, or if we did suspect it, it was probably not a matter of consequence. She had been beautiful ten years before. She was just as beautiful still, girlishly young and sweet and innocent, and she was still that now. She had blue eyes, a hair of flossy gold before. She had blue eyes, a hair of flossy gold before. She had black hair now and dark brown eyes. I noticed these differences, but they did not suggest change to me. She was the same girl she was before, absolutely. I don't know, I can think of a particular individual, and it's like, we met in person, but in a way, we're like uh, dream people to each other. 